and uh, the regulars as well, you're just as welcome. Happy to see all of you. Well, we, I think, can consider ourselves a blessed church because, well, for many reasons, but one of them is that we have children. And we have not just children, but we have infants. Um, and there's more on the way. And that's a good sign. Now, uh, in fact, one of them is going to be dedicated today. Yeah. Um, now, it's interesting that newborns are very needy. In fact, they don't even know what they need, right? All they know is I'm hungry and I need food, right? And so they cry, right? They don't know what else to do. That's not really a, that's not really a plan to get what you want, right? They don't know what to do. They just do what they can. But do you and do I, do we know what we need? And do we know how to get it? Well, this morning, what we're going to read should clarify for us exactly what it is we need and how we get it. But first, let's pray. Father, thank you for, as always, being so good to us. And this morning, we got to worship you, and and we want to continue that worship through your word. Father, would you please reveal yourself to us through your word. Help us to understand what it is that we need, and how do we get it, Father? Father. All glory to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be reading this morning from John 6, verses 1 through 15, and then verses 25 through 29. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming to him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Truly, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. This is God's word. A little bit of a long passage, but hopefully um, there's a lot of food in there for us this morning. Amen? So we see, we're going to see three things, or two things actually that God has for us. One is what we need, and the first we see is that we need God to feed us. Now, I'm going to refer back to my grandson um, as an example. And so his name is Luca, and uh, he's basically helpless. He's absolutely, I I came to that realization. He's never without what he needs, but he doesn't get any of it himself, ever. Right? He's always changed. He's always fed. If he spits up, somebody wipes his mouth, right? But he can't do it himself. He can't even move by himself. He is absolutely and completely helpless. So he's completely dependent, basically on his parents. Without them, he would die. 
He would die on his own. Luca would die. And maybe that's why God made him so dang cute because he's like a magnet. You're just drawn to him. You want to take care of that little kid but because but, uh, he can't do it himself. So Luca depends on his parents, not just for his food, but for them to feed him. He needs to be fed by them. And this story is telling us that God looks at all of us in the same way as Luca is to his parents. We are helpless and needy. We need him not only to give us food, but to actually feed us. So let's look at this story a little more carefully. From the other gospels, all four gospels tell this same story. And we know that Jesus went to this place for a time of rest. He took his disciples, they had been working hard. He wanted them to have a break, have a, a time of rest. So he went to a, a desolate place. In other words, there's nobody around, there's nothing. They could have peace and they could have quiet. But the people had seen all the good things Jesus had done, and so they followed him, right? Just like paparazzi or whatever, I guess, in a way, right? They, they found out where he was, and they went to him. It says Jesus had compassion on them. He was tired. He wanted to rest. But here's these needy people coming to him, and he put off his rest. And it says all day he healed them, and he taught them. But now the day is coming to an end, and there's thousands of people. It says 5,000 men, so they're... There could have been 10,000s all together, men, women, and children. And they're hungry, and they're in the middle of nowhere. How do you solve this problem? Jesus asked his disciples, what are we going to do? What should we do? Basically, they told him, it's impossible. That's what they said. There's no way you could have enough money to buy enough food to feed everybody, to even have a bite. It's impossible. And so Jesus said in another gospel, okay, find out what we have. And the best they could come up with with was a little boy's lunch. Now remember, they couldn't even have sent them away. They couldn't do it, right? This is not, this is first century, uh, the first century of the world, not 21st century. There's no 7-Eleven around the corner you can run to. There's no Costco we can buy huge amounts to feed everybody. No Pizza Hut's going to deliver, right? It's just not possible, it's not practical. So in other words, they're helpless. These people are helpless. They're in the middle of nowhere, they're hungry, and they can't feed themselves. In other words, they need God to do it. So God does. He takes this lunch. What does Jesus do? He says he gives thanks for it, and he distributes it, and everybody gets to eat. Not just eat, but have enough. If you want seconds, if you want thirds, you can have it. Everybody was satisfied. It wasn't like, that's it? Everybody could eat all they wanted. And when they were done, there was more left over than they started with. Now, is this miraculous? Absolutely. Absolutely. But in a sense, it isn't. There is a sense in which this isn't miraculous at all. Because Jesus was just doing what he does all the time, but at an accelerated rate. Where does bread come from? A seed has to go in the ground, and it has to what? Bear more seeds. That becomes bread. It's planted, it's transformed, it bears more fruit. It makes more of itself. And that's where bread comes from. And so one produ uh, seed produces many. Now we play a part in that as people, right? Um, Jesus said at another time, you plant and you water, but God makes it grow. God is the one that makes it grow. So Jesus, he's just doing what he did all the time. He took one seed and made many. He took one lunch and he made many lunches. He, he just did what he's doing all the time. Now, we, we may get our food from 7-Eleven. It may come prepackaged, microwavable, whatever. It doesn't change the fact that it's miraculously provided by God. Right? It, doesn't, it may have been as dramatic, but God's the one that provides all our food every day. And we need that. We need him. We cannot live without him. So even now, even now, I think Luca can sense that he has parents, right? I don't know, I'm not a baby doctor. I don't know the level of his development. But I think he can sense that he has parents, who they are, and that they love him, and they provide for him, they care for him. And hopefully knows he has an opa who loves him too, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he does. I think I'm just another face to that kid. But I'm not, I'm not. Okay, so his parents, not just, they, they meet his needs, right? He has needs and his parents meet them. And that's a good thing. That's the way it's supposed to be. Children are supposed to grow up in a home where they feel secure, that they are loved and, and provided and cared for. 
And so uh, that he will grow up healthy with that assurance. He will become a healthy human being. That's not good just for his parents. It's good for all of society. If every child grew up like that, what, how would society be different? Prison is filled with fatherless children. I mean, it does make an impact. Now, the basic need of a child is a stable, loving home. So fathers, if you're a father here, best thing you can do is love their mother. Show them, prove it that you love their mother. Mothers, if you want healthy children, the best thing you can do is respect their father. Respect the father as the head of the home. Now, Jesus was certain, certain that his father loved him. He, he had no doubt. Jesus had that assurance, and he wants us to be sure that we are loved and cared for by him. That's what Jesus is trying to show us, that he will meet our needs. But some of our needs are deeper than others, harder to satisfy, and that's why the second thing we need is Jesus as food. Now, after Jesus fed the people, they made a big mistake, right? Jesus managed to escape. He did get that time alone, but the next day they managed to catch up to him, and they found him, and they wanted to live off these miracles. They wanted to attach themselves to Jesus. Hey, here's the miracle worker, man. We want to live off these miracles. They'll never end. We'll never run out. In fact, they want to make him king. This guy will be our king. We'll win. We'll get everything we want. But Jesus doesn't want that. He didn't want them to live off the miracles. How do we know that? Remember it said that they gathered up what was left. Why would Jesus do that? Well, one, he wanted them to see that, yes, God provides everything, but what he provides should not be wasted. And if he just said, ah, let it go, they're going to think, well, another miracle will come along. The next time we need something, another miracle will come. And Jesus wasn't saying that. Saying, look, I provided, take care of what I provided for you. Did you ever go to a buffet? Did you ever take more food than you ate? Yes, you did, and so did I. Tons of food is wasted at a buffet. Why? Because it's readily available. We don't care. We didn't pay for it. Not really. We paid an amount. We want to get our money's worth. That's why I don't go to buffets anymore. I can't eat my money's worth. It's too expensive. But it's easy to waste when you know it's, it's always going to come, when it's endless, like a buffet. And Jesus is saying, no, don't regard my gifts that way. Yes, I miraculously provided this, but it's important. Treat it well, treat it with respect. But he also challenges the people who said, you guys are settling for way too little. You, food, is that what you want? I can give you more than that. I can satisfy a deeper hunger than just your food. So let's, let's just imagine for me, if you can, Luca is now three months old, about. But let's imagine when he's 23 years old. And I picked 23 because my dad told my brother at one point that you become a man at 23. And my brother's older than me. My dad never told me that for some reason. (laughs) My brother told me that. And if I look at that, it may be true for some people. It wasn't true for me. I I probably, if I, I think I'm a man now, yes, I can say that. But probably 25, I think I became a man. My wife pretty much turned me into a man. I was a child prior to that. So anyway, whenever it comes, we're going to say Luca becomes a man at 23. Let's say at 23, Luca's mom and dad are still feeding him, telling him when to go to bed, make him go to the bathroom. Let's say that's still happening. Something is wrong if that's happening, right? That's not supposed to happen. That should not happen. Sometimes, you know, there's adults living with their parents, right? Oh, wait, I live with my parents. Yeah. <laughs> Well, sometimes it's okay. It's a different circumstance, okay? So basically, if that were to happen, they would, Luca would kind of be their pet, right? That's what a pet is. You take care of them and, and do everything they need, and they give you a little satisfaction, and there's no growing or development or maturing, right? And that's what we want to be to God. We want to be his pet. God, feed me, scratch me, let me go out to the bathroom. I'm okay with that. That's all I want. Satisfy my needs, God. I'm okay. I want to be your pet. But Jesus doesn't want that. God doesn't want pets. God wants children. Now, you may say, well, aren't we all God's children? Now, we are all made by God. We are all loved by God. But we are not all his children. The Bible doesn't say that. It says that, There are children of God, but to be a child of God, you have to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that's weird. It just sounds so weird. And Jesus goes on to tell the people that are following him because he gave this food. He said, look, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he knew the response he would get. People cannot handle it. Like, that's 
too weird, too strange. That's not what we want. We want to be your pet. And God said, no, I want you to be my child. And so many people stopped following him because of that, because they couldn't handle that. But we are hungry for salvation. And Jesus is the meal that satisfies that hunger. He's the only one. And just as a seed gives its life, its life is transformed so more life can be. Jesus did that. He gave his life so that our life can be transformed, so that God can have many children. So there's a a key passage that we may have overlooked in this story, and it says right at the beginning that this story happened right around the time of the Passover. Now that's not there by accident. We could easily overlook it, but God, anytime you see the Passover, a reference to it, you know something important is going to happen. But what is the Passover? Well, thousands of years before this, God's people, the Israelites, were slaves in Egypt, and God was setting them free through a series of interventions. He was going to make these slaves free people. He did it. They could not free themselves. He did it. The last intervention was death was going to come, death to every firstborn. And to be saved from that spirit of death that was going to come through, God said, you have to do this. This is what you have to do. You have to kill a lamb put its blood on my, your doorstep and eat it. And they said, be ready to go. Be ready to leave because you're going to be set free. Now think about that. Think about if you're in that situation, what are you going to do? What options do you have? You can say, well, I don't believe it. Would you take that chance that your firstborn is going to die or would you follow through and do what God said? All right, I'm killing this lamb. I'm going to eat. I'm going to put it on my doorstep or the door frame, and everybody that did that, death passed by. Now that, that picture was pointing to Jesus all along. That's what Jesus was going to do. That's what Jesus did. On the cross, he became the lamb. He became sacrificed. He gave his blood so that death would pass us by. And he said that we have to eat him. And what is he saying? Why does he say that? Well, he's trying to partially put it in terms that we can understand. So you can believe in, you can, Jesus is, right? Or think about Jesus and Jesus is, but you cannot eat him without meeting him, without interacting with him, without being intimate with him. And that's what God wants. See, as weird as it is, we're, we'll never be like God. God's the creator, we're the created. And yet, it says that we will become his bride. He is going to transform us from what we are, from pets, into children into a bride that marries God. That, uh, it's trippy, it's weird in a way, but that's what he says, that's who we are. But no one's gonna be dragged into that. Who wants to drag somebody to the altar? You're gonna marry me, right? You don't wanna marry somebody, you want somebody who wants to marry you, and that's what God wants. We either come to him willingly or not at all. And Jesus said, so what the, the people ask, okay, what do we have to do? What do I have to do to have this relationship with you, to have this eternal life you're talking about, to have this satisfaction. And what does Jesus say? Does he give them a list of 10 commandments to follow? No, he doesn't. He said, you have to believe. You have to believe, why? Because God made the food, God feeds us the food. All we have to do is accept the food. The work has been done for us. God does the work, God does the transformation. We either say yes or no. It's that simple. It's, it's, it's saying yes or saying no to God. Yes, I will eat you. Yes, I will receive you. I will or I won't. It's that simple. You don't have to understand it all. You don't have to know it all. God's made it quite simple. Eat me or don't. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your, your goodness and your mercy and, and providing for us. These are challenging things. You're calling us to grow up. It's such a simple thing. If you're just the God who, who provides our needs and then we're happy and we're satisfied, but you're calling us to something deeper. You made us for a deeper, a higher relationship. You're calling us to be your children and ultimately you're calling us to become your bride. Thank you, Father, for that. Um, help us to understand it. Help us to give in to that to the best we can, Father, to trust you, to believe in you. That's all you've asked is that we believe. That's a choice. Father, it's a choice we will or we won't. Help us to do that. 
And this morning, I just want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And maybe you haven't gotten to that point where you have done that. You have told Jesus, okay, I'll believe in you. I'll eat you. I want what you want from me, not what I want from you. And I can remember um, when I was 16, I went to somebody's house in Kalama Valley. They told me basically this need that I had for Jesus and I could believe him, I could accept him, and he could come into my life. And I was like, a, at that time, a, a man in the desert. I was dying of thirst. And that news, that information was like a bucket of cold water. It, it satisfied my soul. And I prayed that prayer. I said, I didn't know what I was doing. I just said, Jesus, come into my life. And that began, I was born then. I became God's child then. And you can do that today if you haven't. And so I just want to know if that's the case. Is everybody... We're all of our heads down, eyes closed, but if that's something you're ready to do or you sense God is calling you, brought you to that place, I just want you to raise your hand so I can kind of help you in doing it. Is there anybody this morning? Okay, see one hand. Thank you, Father. Anybody else? Two hands. Thank you, Father. I'm just going to wait a second. Let God do his work. Okay. All right, let's pray together. And, and you can pray this however you want, in your heart, out loud. But essentially, it's, this is between you and Jesus. And you're just going to say, thank you, Jesus. I accept you as my food, and I will eat you by believing in you. And I want that to be your child. I want that new life that comes with that. I want that relationship with you that comes with that. And whether I feel it or not, Father, I trust that I am now a, a newborn creation because of this. And for that, I thank you and I praise you and ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.